Today's Still Mace Warrior partner is Become Stronger. We want to take the time to thank them for the offer that will be provided during this episode and for teaming up with the podcast to provide a better listening experience for you. You can find out more about Become Stronger at become-stronger.com. All right, guys, here we are again with another uh, podcast episode, and I'm actually going to talk a little bit about, and I'm not trying to self-promote here, but um, I started a Patreon page. Um, if you guys want to support this podcast, you guys can check that out. Um, there's a link in my bio on Instagram. You go on my website at somewhysquarrier.com. You guys can check me out there. But I'm kind of excited today because, not kind of, I'm very excited. I'm always excited in every podcast, and I know I mention that all the time. I'm like a repeating machine, but I have uh, Zach, and uh, he's out there in Canada. So this is like actually my, my second international guest, so that's kind of exciting. And uh, yeah, so he owns uh, Warrior Flow Fitness, and he's um, obviously what, head coach, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, so we're going to talk to him about Mace. We're going to ask him about his story. We're going to find out a little bit more. He's actually really active on Instagram. That's how I found him. Um, I love watching this guy. He's, he's just always like doing the traditional stuff too. Like, I love it. I love seeing people swing. So let's just get to know him. So Zach, what's your story? What's your story in fitness? I know that you're in you've done martial arts you've done football rugby you've done um just quite a lot of stuff so let's go into that like tell us a little bit about yourself and your story in fitness and then kind of what led you to the mace uh so i i guess with the whole fitness stuff it started when i was really little like five or six years old um it was how i was allowed to watch tv or play video games that kind of stuff Every commercial break, I would do 10 push-ups, 10 sit-ups. At the end of every show, I would do 100 jumping jacks, and then that slowly increased as I got a little bit older. When I hit my early teen years, I kind of fell out of that kind of stuff a little bit, and I got more interested in just not doing anything, as 12 to 14-year-old boys generally are interested in. Uh, But then I found football and rugby, uh, rugby first and football afterwards. Uh, was pretty successful with football, but rugby was the main passion. I played a lot of representative rugby, so I played for Team Saskatchewan, so the province up here. I played for the Prairie Wolfpack, which was uh, a combination team of three different provinces. So that was a super select team, which was uh, a huge opportunity to play for. And through that, I did get a call from Canada uh, to do a workout for them. But two days before I received the call, I blew my ACL out. So I tore my ACL, my meniscus, and I bruised my femur to a near fracture. So that took me out of the game for at least a year. Um, From there, I got seriously depressed as a lot of athletes who get severely injured are. And having been an emotional eater all my life, I went hard down that route. I went from uh, 215 playing weight all the way up to 267 in the span of about six months. Uh, Tried to go back to rugby hurt myself a little bit just a small thing like just a a sprain in my knee again but it freaked me out enough to keep me away for a whole for a whole nother season then about midway through my comeback season um i shattered my fibula so i broke my fibula one way and then it broke back the other oh god bone where there's only supposed to be one and that pushed all the muscle off my feet as well um and going into that injury after that injury I had gotten back down to about 235, so still a fair bit heavier than my regular playing weight, but nowhere as heavy as I was at my, uh, my biggest. <clears throat> so I knew when I broke my leg, I couldn't let myself put on another 50 pounds because then I'd be even heavier than I was when I was uh, after I blew my knee out. So I started doing some research on movement and things I could do while my leg was busted up and then just eating right as well. My mom had kind of in between my injuries started doing uh this so she opened a gym called readiness fitness which was 100 percent female so all female clients all female trainers and she kind of helped me along with that and i with the whole leg break thing i ended up losing my job as well because i couldn't do what i was required to do in the position so she brought me in just to do all the bookkeeping stuff so i would spend hours just going through the gym's files making sure everyone had the right information, making sure everyone was paying and all that. Uh, And that kind of started inspiring me to stay active as much as I can with the broken leg and eat right. So I didn't get uh, thrown a whole bunch of weight. 
Uh, and I did, obviously, from having to be a little more sedentary, going from full rugby season to being on crutches, but nowhere near the extreme of when I blew my knee out. So from there, uh, after a little while, getting more comfortable around the gym, my mom was wanting to bring in kids classes. So ages six to 11, and none of her, team, or her current instructors wanted to teach. So I volunteered, having coached little kids in football and rugby in the past. I thought it'd be a good fit. So I did that for a little while. That was, um, what would that have been, September 2014 to May 2015. I just taught kids classes. That's then, interesting. That's cool. It was really cool. It was something different. Uh, it just at that age, they have so much energy that it's a challenge to get them, well, one, reeled in, and two, um, to get them to work to their capacity, right? Because they can just go, 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 go. Like mm -hmm. I tell my, uh, my grown-up clients, okay, we're going to do rolls or cartwheels. And they'd be like, oh, I can't do that. And they'd be super tentative. I'd be like, okay, we're going to do rolls or cartwheels. And suddenly they're just flipping over. <laughs> I can so that was totally awesome uh, but eventually I wanted to move on a little bit and grow a little bit so at that time I was uh, certified through ISSA and I decided that I was going to up the ante a little bit get what's called CanFit Pro certification so it was a little more rigorous testing and uh, training for that and then while I was doing that I was uh, I'd fallen in love with kettlebells mm. as so many Mace people start right with yep. kettlebells so I started with the kettlebells, played around with them just on my own, watching videos from On It uh, was the big one, and Primal Fit, which is like an offshoot of On It up here in Canada. Like they sell all the On On It stuff, so that we don't have to worry about like crazy shipping from Texas or whatever. Oh. Um, and because of that, I ended up going to an Agatsu certification. So Agatsu is this awesome company up here in Canada. They're based out of Montreal, who go all around the world and certify people in kettlebells, mace, clubs. Uh, mobility, ollie lifting, like just all sorts of different training methods. And I went and I took my kettlebell certification uh, from a great trainer named Kim. And yeah, I got into the kettlebells pretty heavy for a while, was going to train for or started training for a kettlebell competition, but then decided getting married would be pretty cool. So all my money went to that instead of traveling for right on. Uh, and I, I don't regret it at all. It's definitely awesome. the right choice. Um, if you're ever wondering, get married or do a competition, get married. Get married. <laughs> and I'm not just saying that because my wife's probably going to listen to this. Uh, <laughs> She's listening. And then, yeah. And then after, so I had my, I got some kettlebell certification and I needed to get a few more, like another certification about a year and a half later, just for my CECs, my continuing education credits. So I went to an Agatsu mobility course. Uh, one, everyone needs more mobility in their lives. Like no matter how flexible or stable you are, you want that. You want to increase that. You want to improve that. Plus they were teaching things like cartwheels and skin the cat and all sorts of crazy stuff. So I wanted to try that out. So I went there and while I was there, the instructor for that one, her name is Sarah Blair, uh, another just fantastic trainer. She started talking to me about a masters of movement event. So Gatsu do, does this thing called uh, masters of movement events where they're train cations as they call them. So sometimes they do them in Bali, sometimes they do them in Nicaragua. Uh, the one I ended up attending was in Los Angeles. So I went down to Los Angeles for a week and the whole theme of the week was flow. So we surfed, we did Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, we did Capoeira, we did jump rope and we got certified in Steel Mason Indian Club. So right that was my on. first time picking up the mace or trying that stuff out and uh, I immediately fell in love with it. Uh, Sean joked while I was down there, Sean Mosin, he's the owner of Agatsu. He joked while I was uh, swinging a club down there one day, he came up to me and he said, if, you know, if I looked like you, I'd probably only swing clubs and maces. He said, ah. people, people could ask if it was effective and I would say, I don't know, but at least I look cool. So yeah. that kind of, I do have a, like a name, like I'm big, I'm tattooed and I have a beard like this. So most people, when I tell them, when they ask, well, what do you do for fitness? I'm like, oh, I swing a 20 kilo mace around. They're like, okay, yeah, no, that makes sense. <laughs> it does, right? Yeah. But even before that, I guess the first time I'd heard about the mace was in this book called Lift. I can't remember the title mm -hmm. of the author off the top of my head, but it's, uh, it's essentially a history of fitness. So it briefly for like two pages talks about Indian clubs and gadas or maces and their history in, uh, in India and the surrounding area 
So that was the first time I'd ever heard about it. And I was like, oh, that's kind of neat, but just kept reading, right? Glossed over it, started reading about some other stuff. Right. But had I not read that book, I might not have gone down to the Masters of Movement event. Uh, reason being, near the end of that book, he talks a lot about the acro scene, uh, the acro yoga scene in Venice Beach, which was where this certification was being held. So I was reading about these people doing all these amazing things. So I looked them up on Instagram. And if you follow any of those acro people on Instagram, the way they move is just astounding. Right. So I went on the trip just so I could watch them move in person. And then I ended up finding my passion down there. And I've, there's, I don't think a day has gone by since then where I haven't swung either a mace or a club or both around. So it was a, definitely a trip that changed my life. Yeah. And then that's kind of, so you're saying that's kind of like what got you into the mace and yeah. Um, yeah. So I guess yeah, humble beginnings, pushups and sit-ups between TV shows to 20 years of history into uh, swinging these things around. Right on. So one thing that you mentioned was how important mobility is. Yes. Um, maybe we can go a little bit into mobility and still mace. And I know they're kind of like related and we can do that with the still mace, but what do you, what do you recommend like for people when it comes to mobility and using the still mace? So mobility and mace, like you said, they go hand in hand, uh, especially when we look at the more traditional moves or competition style moves of the 10 and two and the 360. I'm taking X amount of pounds and I'm putting it behind my head and trying to loop it around, right? So if my shoulders are locked down or my chest is locked down, my elbows, wrists, any of the above, uh, even your trunk, uh, your trunk mobility, your spine mobility, your hip mobility, it's all super important. So first, how we define mobility um, is a little different than how other companies define mobility. So we don't think of it just as a placeholder for flexibility. So you hear a lot of that. People say mobility, but what they mean is flexibility. For us, mobility is the balance of flexibility and stability. So you're flexible enough to get into this position, but you're stable enough to control it. Uh, mm. So it's kind of that circling between and that control, knowing when you need to be a little more flexible, when you need to be a little more stable and being able to be balanced with it. So yeah. how that applies to the steel mace, if I'm taking my maces, um, I have just my five kilo here, but like if I were to pick up a 20 kilo mace and try to put it behind my head, if I was too flexible and not stable enough, I'm going to pop, I'm going to lose it. There's going to be a ton of tension in my low back. It's going to pull my shoulders out of place. If I'm too stable and not flexible enough, I might not be able to even get into that back position. I might be clipping my head. I might be bumping my body or whatever. Uh, if we want to talk mobility and the flow style of training, if your hips are locked down, if you can't get into those nice, strong lines, you're going to have issues with flow. You're not going to be able to be as smooth in your transitions. Uh, or your, um, or even hitting your landmarks as you would compared to someone who has that mobility, that balance of flexibility and stability. So mobility is huge. We start every single session off with at least 10 minutes of mobility. And then we stretch for five minutes at the end. And the last session of every week is just a pure mobility session. So we just do mobility for the entire hour. Uh, we involve the light clubs, the light Indian clubs, uh, to help open up those shoulders, elbows, wrists, uh, and then just a lot of body weight stuff as well. And really how I define fitness is your ability to move at your current size. I don't care how, what your weight is. Like if you're 350 pounds, but you can do a back handspring, you're the fittest person I know. Like that's unreal. Um, so for me, it comes down to what, how you can move and mobility plays a ton into that, right? Mobility, mobile movement, it's all the same. So for me, mobility is a huge base of fitness and especially a huge tool to being able to swing a, a mace around. Right. Big, what, do you, big, what do you recommend? Because like, most people are going to be listening to this online and yes. they're going to want to look for resources. Yes. What do you recommend like, mobility-wise? I know Agatsu has a YouTube. Can they find yes. stuff on there? Agatsu has some stuff. Uh, they also do uh, full certifications in both upper and lower mobility. Uh, and mobility specifically for ollie lifters, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. So I highly recommend that. Um, reaching out to someone who knows is always a big thing. Finding, say, an Agatsu coach, an Onnit coach. Uh, another big one is, um, I, I, I want to say his Instagram name is Hunter Fitness. Something like that, Hunter MB Fitness. The most mobile person I've ever seen in my life. Just ridiculously mobile. Um, reaching out to those people, because they're always happy to help. The... the 
it's tough to do just in conversation like this or right. online because if someone comes to me and they want to say, I want to be more mobile, I now need to distinguish whether they mean they need more flexibility or they need more stability or they need both. Hmm. Right. Right. If someone comes in and they're like, my shoulders aren't mobile enough to do a 10 and two. It's like, okay, well, are you not flexible enough or are you flexible enough, but you're out of control? You have no stability. So then you have to, you have to kind of pick and choose what you're going to build from there. So finding someone who knows what they're talking about and interacting with them in one way or another uh, right. is huge. There's tons of YouTube videos out there that can help. Uh, Instagram is a fantastic tool for learning. Um, when I first got into the fitness community, I taught only women and kids. So all my Instagram feed was um, female fitness people. I soon realized that they generally especially like in the, the bodybuilding community are not really posting what they're doing so much as like, here's my butt. Uh, so I, my feed is way more educational now. Like I've been able to like sift through a lot of the crap and that's a big thing is 90% of what's posted on Instagram or YouTube or whatever is just filler. It's just junk. It's just crap. It's sifting through and finding those few people out there who really have their heads on and who are really out there looking to help people finding them and trying to associate with them as much as possible. Um, right. And there's truth to that. I, I think I started going out and that's how I met, I met Matt Burberry. And then from yeah. there, it kind of just went down, you know, it started with the podcast idea, but it started with Matt. And then from there, it's like everything opened up, doors opened up. And I started to talk to a bunch of different people on Instagram and on YouTube and Facebook. And that has helped tremendously. Oh, for sure. Like Matt's a great resource. Um, he, his content is it's dialed in, right? He's showing you substance. Um, that's something, uh, again, Agatsu preaches a lot is substance. Uh, Sean has, he's full of t uh, awesome quotes, but one of my favorites is when someone has nothing to show, they show everything. And that's, he refers to that when uh, someone on Instagram as opposed to showing some new technique or new skill they've picked up is just posting a quick like, here's my butt in the mirror photo, <laughs> right? whatever. So they have nothing to show, so they're, so they're showing everything as opposed to someone like Matt or Leo or um, like Steel Mace Gypsy. They're showing mm -hmm. content, they're showing substance, right? They're 100% pure substance. They're gonna swing something, they're gonna do something beautiful with their bodies, with their mace, and they're putting out substance, which, which is awesome. That's what you want in your Instagram feed because it's so positive and uplifting and educational, right? Like. So I went down to LA, got my steel mace certification, came back up here and I was like, okay, cool. I love the steel mace. I love swinging it around, but how can I relay that into three sessions a week for three different groups? So nine sessions a week total, how am I going to relay that in? So I started looking for more resources and found Leo doing all his crazy flow stuff that he does. And I, I loved that. So I started playing around with some of his stuff at the time he was running a Patreon and I was, I followed his Patreon for a little bit and I learned a little bit from there. And then I just started developing my own style of flow, which is like dramatically different than his style, but that's the beauty yeah. of flow, right? Is everyone has their own little, little quirks, little, uh, styles and systems with it. Exactly. So, yeah. It's, it's awesome. Like Instagram's a huge tool. Like it can be a fantastic tool. It's just making sure you sift through the bullshit and find the substance. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And you know, one of the tip, just look up uh, hashtag still mace. And honestly, most yeah, exactly. people that are like flowing and doing the traditional stuff, they'll pop up on there. Oh yeah. There, there, and there's really so wanna. many people out there doing mace that I just, I had no idea. And it's like every, every day I'm finding someone new that just blows my mind. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's interesting to see how much it's, it's growing and it's growing and it's growing and every day yeah and i'm sure we're both really happy to be part of that uh oh. you know mace movement that's what rick brown says the mace movement or the mace unity uh oh, yeah and rick's awesome too like he uh the way he breaks things down is is fantastic like anyone who has an opportunity to go and learn from one of these like top-notch people go do so taking a gatsu cert an audit cert a leo workshop uh, a rig workshop, uh, coach RT three on Instagram, rich Thurman. Yes, totally. He is the smartest person I have ever talked to when it comes to steel maze. Uh, <laughs> first thing I ever wrote on my whiteboard here was from a conversation he and I had, 
Like he's, he's brilliant. Yeah, um, yeah. I just wish, I wish I was in a position where I could just travel and learn from these people. You know, like yeah, yeah. if I ever win the lottery, I'm going to, I'm going to keep travel. doing the lawyer flow thing, but I'm going to travel and learn from as many people as possible. Like this, totally. and this year, actually, like I'm going down to Connecticut in um, September to do that workshop with uh, Paul Terrace Wal- Walt Kowinski, I think is how you say his last uh-huh, name. Uh-huh. And uh, Kelly Manzone, like Kel's Mellis. I know. Kelly was really excited about that. Yeah. So I'm, I'm super pumped to go down there. And that's, it's, yeah, honestly, that's a dream trip. As weird as it is going to Wilton, Connecticut, like with 18,000 people, that is a dream trip because I'm going to get to train with Kelly. I'm going to get to train with Matt, uh, Paul, um, Will Calavani, uh, Heathenly Father on Instagram. He's going to be there. Like, it's just, it's going to be like an awesome event to meet all these people I've like looked up to on Instagram for the last 18 months or however long I've been doing Mace. I, I bet that's going to be like the best feeling in the world. That's kind of like what I want to do in the future too. I want to meet all these people that I'm having guests on, you know, like I want to meet all of you in person. That's just, that's awesome. You know, totally. it, it's, um, it's been such a solid community, which I, I love and appreciate. Totally. It's so positive too. There's no like, there's, I know there was a time when there was a, a very big divide between like flow and traditional style, but nowadays it seems more like, we're all just happy that people are using the same tool that we're, we love, right? Like, I love this mace, and I just want as many people to love the mace as possible, even if they're doing a completely different style. Right. So what, um, I guess, the next question I have is kind of what made you, um, how do I say this? Like, what was the... <sighs> Like, what made you realize that the mace was, like, the tool that you wanted to use? And why do you think, why do you want people to love the mace? Like, there has so, to be a reason behind that. Yeah, I, it's a very good question because it's just kind of a tough one to answer. Um, what I, when I realized I loved the mace was probably the first time I did try a flow with it. And I realized how versatile the tool it was. So with like, again, having played football and rugby, a lot of the training on that was go run, go do deadlift squats, bench press, which are awesome. Great tools. They can build the body, but having done martial arts more so as a kid, I wanted more movement, more diversity, more style, more flair. I'm flashy. I have purple hair. I have a beard (laughs) down to here. I'm covered in tattoos. I'm flashy. Right. So yeah. The only way to be flashy with those lifts is if you're throwing up huge weight. With the mace, I can be a little flashy with my movement style, and I can throw up some pretty big weight with it, so I kind of get that, that double. But really, the first time I ever taught a class and I saw that sparkle in someone else's eye, I was like, oh, okay, that's kind of neat. And they're like, this is such a different style. This is such a different system. Like, I've never done anything like this. And I think that's why I started to get passionate about introducing the mace to more and more people. Uh, I have this little book that I carry around with me all the time where I write down all the flows I come up with in. Uh, but I also write down um, like a number of how many people I've put uh, a mace into their hands. So I've had about 90 people that have never touched a steel mace that end up with a mace in their hands because of me. And that I, I'm so fulfilled by that. Like, that's such a cool thing. I have my brother-in-law, he swings a mace with me three times a week, and he's actually going to be get, uh, getting his mace certification in September. Right on. My 50 plus year old father-in-law swings with us every like three times a week. My mother-in-law just started swinging a mace recently. What? Uh, yeah, like my whole, my wife uh, has tried it a little bit. The only family member that hasn't really yet is my five month old daughter, but give me <laughs> Oh, um, she will. Oh, totally. She will. And, and you're going to be filming it. I'm going to be on Instagram stalking her. Oh, it's going to be awesome. It's going to be great. People have been telling me since she was born, they're like, oh, now you need to get her a little steel mace rattle because she has dumbbells. The little, yeah. You'll just see her doing this. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> she, has little, she has little dumbbell rattles and like she like throws them all around and loves them. And yeah, people are like, you need to get a steel mace rattle. I'm like, that would just be a normal rattle. Like, right. Same shape, right? <laughs> but, but no, like, yeah, it's become a family affair, which just makes me even more passionate about it. Uh, and like I said, the big thing is just how versatile it is. Is not only can I use it to train my body in the competition style, I can also use it to train my body in the flow style. Beyond that, I can use it to train my mind. I come up with 
very step-by-step-by-step -step -step flows uh, just because of my teaching style as opposed to someone like Leo who's just very fluid and dynamic and he just kind of comes up with it as he does it which is astounding to me yeah uh, I'm very this is step one this is step two this is step three this is step four just because I find it easier to teach that way um so it's built my mind too because I'm now having to remember step to step to step to step to step, to step and be able to break it down enough to, to show it to somebody who maybe doesn't have that movement style ingrained in them, like someone who did martial arts or football or whatever did right. in the past. So it trains my body, it trains my mind, and I've used it a ton just for my heart and soul as well. Like I'll throw on some yoga music, my salt lamp, some incense, and then I'll just swing. I'll swing and I'll swing and I'll swing. I've used it to grieve. Like I've had people pass and I'll burn some sweet grass and just swing my mace until it's burnt out and feel so much better. So my soul, my heart feels so much more refreshed afterwards. So it's really, to me, it's become that all encompassing tool. It's not just for my body. It's from body, mind, and soul. Like it gets my whole being, which if you can ever find anything to hit all three. Right. And that's definitely something that attracted me. It was definitely that whole mind, body, spirit. And, um, I guess that's why it connected with me. I'm a very spiritual person. So as I was, you know, as I was using this tool, it just, it made sense. I don't know how to explain that, but you know, I was using it and it just fit. Like well, in a puzzle. There's something so primal about it too, you know, like for X amount of millennia, people were walking around with things that looked a lot like this and doing these kind of movements, maybe with a more aggressive manner behind it. But I, I feel, um, like genetic memory is there. And when you pick up a club or a mace and you start swinging around, you just get that primal satisfaction from doing something your ancestors did to survive for millennia, right? It's like right. the first time you start a fire using flint and steel is like such a crazy rush, right? All it is is you're striking some stuff against some other stuff, right? But yeah. you get that primal, like, yeah, I made this fire. And it's the same thing with the mace, right? It's just that primal genetic memory being satisfied it just uplifts the body, mind, and soul. It's, it's a beautiful thing. Yeah, and I wonder if that's the reason why, like you mentioned that you've had 90 people use the mace, and I'm pretty sure 90 people came back to you. I'm pretty sure it's that primal aspect to it. I, definitely. It's, yeah. I, I'm, a, I'm a big believer in uh, the genetic memory theory, which is essentially um, within our genes, things that have occurred frequently enough throughout generations get ingrained in us. Uh, I'm a firm believer of that. And I, I honestly think that's why so many people come in and they swing a mace for the first time. And then they're messaging me like 20 minutes later being like, Hey, that workout kicked my butt. When can we do it again? You know? Yeah. So I, I think, I think it's just, it's in us, you know, genetically it's just in us. Yeah. And it's cool that you mentioned that. Cause I remember in college I was taking anthropology and there was an article that they had us write about, and it was talking a little bit about that, about genetics and how even emotions can get trapped totally. in your like DNA. And I thought that was crazy, but totally. there's some there's some truth to that. There has to be. So. I read a study once uh, about lab mice where they took this thing that lab mice weren't afraid of. I can't remember what it was, was off the top of my head, and they like would terrify these mice with it for generations. They did it for like four or five generations. They took the thing away for a couple of generations and they brought it back to a generation that had never seen it before and they were terrified of it. Wow. And to me, I was like, oh, that's so cool. Like that's the, what introduced me to genetic memory. And I definitely, there's, there, I think there's credence to it. Like take it or leave it, your beliefs are your beliefs. But to me, genetic memory is a big thing. And I think that's why some people just take to the mace like a fish to water, you know? Right. Genetics. So I've seen you, and I thought it was awesome. You built the, the fucking platforms, right, yeah. for the, the mace competition stuff. Yes. I kind of want to go into that because I kind of went into that with Don from the, the 8X Clubs and Maces, and he actually wrote some roles for it. And uh, if, if anyone's listening, go check that podcast out. But, uh, yeah, let's talk about competition. Let's see how, okay. you know, it works over there where you're at. Okay, so uh, Competition Canada, there's kind of two groups doing it. There's more so the Agatsu proper, uh, and then there's us, Warrior Flow. Um, while we are certified with Agatsu, uh, myself and the two trainers that work underneath me, uh, we're all certified through Agatsu, 
but we don't really work for them, if that makes sense. It's like how Leo has his audit certification, but he doesn't really work for them, you know? Right. Um, so the Agatsu competitions are generally a combination of mace and kettlebell. So there are people, there are people there competing in kettlebell and there are people there competing in mace. And sometimes they, they do both. Uh, so the way their competitions run, there are five minute long sets to do 10 and twos or 360s. So for example, I went to Toronto last October to do the mace competition there. I competed in the five minute 10 and two set. Three hours later, I did the five minute 360 set. <clears throat> in the Agatsu competitions, you use an Agatsu mace. They make their own maces. They're beautiful, highly recommend. Ah. They, they use the 10 kilo for male, so 22 pounds, or the eight kilo, so about 18 pounds for females. Uh, and that's it. So you have just the op, that one option. Use the 10 kilo if you're a dude, use the eight kilo if you're female, uh, whether that be 10 and twos or 360s. Uh, and then there's rules with like pull and backswing and all that. Um, but when I went out there and I did that, I had a ton of fun. It was a great experience. I was successful with it, but the field was very small because to confidently swing a 10 kilo mace for a male or an eight kilo mace uh, for a female, it, it, it can be a challenge, right? right? <clears throat> so when I decided I wanted to bring a competition to Saskatchewan, I wanted to make it a little more inclusive. So how my rules broke down were you can use male or female, you can use any size mace you want, so long as it's in the Gatsu mace. The reason I did that, I won a little bit of loyalty, but the big thing is the Gatsu handles are the exact same size no matter how heavy the head is. Got it. So my five kilo mace here has the exact same handle as my 25 kilo mace over there. So because of that, it just kind of evens the playing field a little bit, right? It's like kettlebells. Uh, in competition, you use a competition kettlebell because the horn is exactly the same width, same diameter from an eight kilo to a 28 kilo, right? It's the same. Uh, so I wanted to add that. And then how we determined uh, the placing was your amount of pulls multiplied by your mace weight. So then people were still encouraged to use a heavier mace. So as opposed to having 10 people all swinging a five kilo mace, we had people swinging five, sixes, eights, tens. Uh, I don't think we had anyone do 12s this, this time around, but uh, my brother-in-law's building to it for the next time. Um, and then, yeah, so because of that, when I went out to Toronto, there were four guys that competed with the mace and not a single female. Oh, wow. When I held my competition, there were 15 competitors in total. I want to say nine male and six female. So it, it was a much larger field, which was awesome. It had more people on platform. Uh, and then I also added a 10 minute long 10 and two set just to throw a little extra challenge. That must have kicked people's asses. Oh yeah. They were, they were, <laughs> they were probably <laughs> drenched in that girl. They were, they were definitely gassed. Wow. Um, and I, I love it. Like the, the competition, it was a ton of fun to compete in in Toronto and it was even more fun to host. Uh, that's yeah. something I'd love to do in the near future is try and take my system and bring it to other places and, and see how that goes and see how other people like it. My clients had a great time. Uh, they were all happy with their numbers that they put up. And it worked well. It worked well. Yeah. I didn't right. even know that um, Agatsu made maces. That's actually yeah. interesting. Like if someone wanted to buy one, I mean, it's, it, they're in Canada, right? I mean, it'd probably be expensive to ship, ship one out this way, but I mean, they sell them, right? Yeah. And so that's the nice thing. So, um, I being in Canada, shipping can be ridiculous from places in the States. So for example, like if I was looking at an on it, 10 pound mace, uh, shipping is generally more than the actual mace itself. Wow. So the mace is like what? 50 bucks or something like that. Yeah. Uh, shipping. The last time I checked was about $50 as well. So uh, you end up paying double, uh, as opposed to with my Agatsu, for those of you watching on the video here, um, exact same size as like we, we rate them in kilos just because we're up here in Canada. So this is my five kilos, so 11 pounds. Uh, it was $45 and then $15 shipping. So 60 bucks total as opposed to close to hundred. 
So right. in Canada, it's generally an easier option for us to go through a Gatsu. Uh, and like I mentioned, they do the same handle diameter no matter what the size is. So you don't have to readjust to other maces like uh, I won't name brands, but there was another brand selling at a local fitness store here. And when I went to go look at their maces, their 15 pound was like probably eight inches taller than their 10 pound and a half inch thicker in diameter in the handle. So you completely have to readjust your style and your technique just to be able to use the next size up. As right. Opposed, my five kilo, if I jump to my eight kilo, the only thing that needs to change is my strength and I had my technique can stay exactly the same, which is beautiful right. um, because I'm now just eliminating factors and being able to move up. Plus, a Gatsu uh, has a ton of variety in sizes. We have the five kilo, eight, six, five, six, eight, 10, 12, 15, 20, and a 25 kilo mace being the biggest. So that's a 55 pounder. Um, right on. And it's cool to hear, uh, you know, you know, your opinion on that, because I remember talking to Rick and Rick was like, try a variety of masives, like try everything, you know, so it's cool to hear like, everyone's opinion on that, you know, because I know Leo was talking about uh, one brand having like smaller uh, handles or like the thickness wasn't as big as on it. And so it's cool to see everyone's like, unique so, and everyone will have their opinion based on what they've used right and like i have uh, another brand we have nine inclines which i got off amazon so that's super awesome that you can get this the mace on amazon yeah um, and they're they're way narrower and they have their benefits right like when i have clients doing flows with the agatsu and it's just too much because of the handle diameter they bump down to an incline Good to go so right. th there is uh, a give and take with it and it is good to to mix things up to try different styles different systems but when it comes to a pure competition standpoint right I think best to I, I, again just coming from my sports background you want to practice as you play so i i swing when i'm in preparation for a competition i will swing my mace in the exact style I'm going to swing when I step on that platform as much as I possibly can, just so it's ingrained in me and I can eliminate all the factors. Right. Um, like, yeah, we, we have some variety here. Um, what I really want one day is like one of Don's addicts races. Yeah. They're like super cool. But again, shipping is ridiculous from the States, <laughs> but I have a, um, a billable mace that a customer or I should say customer, a client uh, made for me. So right it, on. Yeah, and it's massive. It's, uh, it has a 12-inch diameter head, so it's, like, huge. Wow. Um, and it's fillable with water. So without any water in it, it's about uh, 18 pounds. And I haven't filled it all the way up yet, but just based on math, I can probably get it to about 60-plus with water. Wow. It would be, like, ridiculous. Um, now, have you, have you swung that on Instagram? Because I feel like I've seen you with it. Yeah, I have. Uh, and I, I did a flow with it, too, actually. Right which, on. Uh, which was terrifying. Because <laughs> I had like an I had like an under sweep thing where I was, so I was out in an archer position and then I tucked in and I s did a sweep in front of me. The very first time I did it, I didn't take into account the size of it and it brushed the hair on my feet. And I had oh. to put it down for a second to kind of reevaluate how I was going to do it, so I didn't take my shin out and try it again. It's all right, but yeah, going with water in the head of a mace completely changed the game. Yeah. And I think that's something, uh, and I keep going back to this, but Rick, uh, he has, you know, he uses those maces that they kind of give that swoosh sound. Yeah. Like swoosh, yeah. So, uh, slosh maces. There you uh, go. Uh, I, I believe the ones he uses come from this company called Evil Monkey. Melody down at Evil Monkey. They're awesome. So those are actually the maces that I was first certified on. So even though I, I was certified through a Gatsu, I didn't touch an Agatsu mace until I like got up here and ordered them myself. Uh, we learned on Evil Monkey Maces because they're a California business and we were in California at the time. Right. They're all, and they're awesome. Uh, so even when they're hollow, when they're empty, they'll have a little bit of that offset weight, which makes a mace a mace. But then you can add sand, buckshot, water. The water is such a different thing. Like I, I generally don't use my fillable too much uh, just because, I, again, I'm very specific when it comes to my goals. But I was playing around with it the other day. And the timing is just so different than when you're swinging a fixed weight because you almost have to take into, and not almost, you entirely have to take into account how the water's moving within the head to be able to successfully do it. 
So I was doing alternating singles. So like uh, 10 and twos, but switching hands one hand at a time. Right. And I, I completely had to like slow right down. I was listening for the slosh to try and time it. Cause if you can get the water to help pull you in the backswing, it's going to make it way easier. But then if the wave's still coming to say your left and you're going to go back to your right, you'll have to wait for it. Otherwise you're fighting it and it creates this torque and this twist and this tension. So it wow. just it adds a completely different game to your swing. Take something you've done every single day and then add water to it and it just completely changes it. It's awesome. That's crazy. It's now, awesome. I love it. Yeah, I think, yeah. So I, I haven't really heard anyone talk about the Evil Monkey Mesa. So that's interesting to hear. So, so yeah, they're awesome. Highly recommend them. Yeah, right on. Thank you for sharing that. So I'm pretty sure listeners are going to love that. Um, so women. Women yeah. in Mace. I'm over here trying to promote it towards women. What do you think about that? Like, out of your 90 students, how many are women? And do you think that this is going to be, like, women powered down the line? Hard yes. <laughs> Hard yes. So, like I mentioned, um, when mom started – Ready this fitness, it was purely women. So this, this gym in, at its foundation is a female only fitness uh, facility. The only time we train males are in warrior flow. So in steel mace or in Spartan, uh, as my mom is uh, the only level two Spartan coach in Canada. Or, right. um, only female Spartan coach around. So awesome. real quick, does your mom have an Instagram? Uh, just the business one, it's ready this fitness. All right. Yeah. I wanted to see your mom. Yeah. But yeah, go, go right in this fitness. She posts some stuff there. She's awesome. She's great. Uh, so, si- single mom my whole life. Super powerful woman is the, the easiest way to put it. So because of that, I identify as a feminist. I'm surrounded by women all the time. Uh, as I, I said, when I found out I was having a daughter, I'm just surrounded by estrogen all the time. So it was bound to happen. Yeah, but yeah. back to, to women with me. So if I've instructed 90 people, I would say maybe 15 would be males. The rest would be females. Wow. So, yeah, so it's awesome. Actually, when Warrior Flow first started in June of last year, it wasn't Warrior Flow, it was Warrior Women. And then I had my father-in-law and a couple of the Spartans express interest in it. So just to make it a little more inclusive, we morphed it into warrior flow, opened it up to both genders and it, it's going incredibly well, but women take to it. Um, I break movement down into two styles, yin and yang, uh, which is terms everyone who's listening to this has heard before. And, right. Uh, I got that. The, the reason I use yin and yang is from a Bruce Lee book, the Tao of Kung Fu. Uh, Every Mace instructor quotes Bruce Lee at some point or another because he's the greatest. But for me, what really stuck out in this book, The Tao of Kung Fu, completely changed my thoughts and my philosophy on movement within the first 86 pages. And a lot of that came from his talk on yin and yang and firm and soft or gentle and strong and the balance between the two. And a lot of traditional training is very what I now refer to as yang. So bench press, squat, deadlift. You're not flowing, it's just pure grind muscle power, right? When we get into kettlebells and mace, we use a lot of momentum, we use a lot of sweeping motion, which in the Tao Kung Fu book, uh, Bruce akins to yin. So I find mace training, while it has its yang elements, uh, it is very yin. Like it's a good balance of yin and yang, but it is very, very yin. And I find females move yin just way better, way better than males. Uh, so because of that, it's, it's just awesome to watch. I'll, I'll throw two, like a male and a female client next to each other. And the male will do the flow, but it'll be very rigid. And they really hit the landmarks and they own the position. And then the female, her transitions will just be fluid and beautiful and smooth and strong. And they're both getting things from it. They're both loving it but it's just such different styles. And honestly, it is so much easier to teach uh, a female than it is to teach some dude who's been in the gym for 20 years doing the same three movements. I love it. Or even you take a woman that's been in the gym for 20 years doing the same three movements, she's going to be way more 
open to trying out that new movement. Uh, and I, yeah, it's just the majority of my clients are female. They own it. They rock it. I just had seven 16 year old volleyball girls swing in the mace. Oh, on on. That's so they, cool. They crushed it. They yeah. crushed it. It's, no, it's obviously, perfect. obviously they're using the mace. There's some benefit there, right? I oh, mean, totally. so what's the benefit? Like if, if, if someone listening is in, in sports, like what's the benefit uh, of the mace for them? So when people generally ask me that question, I like to say it's a great way to build your strength while working your mobility. So strength through mobility. So again, as opposed to getting stuck in one frame of movement, I'm taking it on multiple planes of movement. So one that's huge because I don't think I've ever seen a sport that happens in a single plane of movement right? Except for like powerlifting, whatever. But even right. if we look at strongman, so the, the toughest, strongest dudes on earth, they're not moving in one direction, right? right? There are a few events, but they need to now pick something up and go forward or whatever. Uh, so the mace is nice because it can train us in all different styles of movement, all different forms of movement, especially once we accept flow into our lives. So with the more traditional moves, the 10 and twos and the three sixties, it is very one plane of movement in the sense that uh, we're going side to side for the most part. Uh, and we're doing everything we can to prevent going forward and back. But because we're doing those things to prevent going forward and back, we are working that strength as well. <clears throat> it hits that rotational and that anti-rotational as well by preventing us from twisting, turning it. Again, just staying stable, right? Mm -hmm. We build a mobility through it, which is great. And then again, when we get into that flow, I'm now moving forward and then rotating, going sideways, going back, going up, going down. I'm working every plane of movement, every plane of motion, which is huge for an athlete. Again, no, no sport just goes straight forward. You need to build strength on all planes, and the mace is a fantastic tool for that. Builds coordination. Uh, again, especially if you're doing those flows, builds the coordination, builds the brain food up. You get tons of brain nourishment from trying to remember, learn, or create flows. <clears throat> so yeah, benefits for athletes is, is just perfect cross training because you're training on several different planes. You're building your strength and your mobility. Uh, and I can't think of anyone who couldn't use more grip strength, right? Just in daily right. life. So right. It's huge. It's just to refer back to the volleyball girls I have working with it. So in the sport of volleyball, there's essentially your three moves from what I know. There's your bump, your set, and your spike. <clears throat> Right, so in the bump, they need that nice, strong, stable base, and they need to be able to control it. So even just taking something like the mace, which is an offset leverage tool, so all the weight at the one end, and making them do squats, or even just sit in a squat hold and keep that mace stable. So I'm building the strength in their shoulders, their core, and their legs, so that when they go to hit that bump, they're in that perfect, mm. their, their strength is perfectly for it. When we look at that setting motion, it's that coordination, that hand-eye coordination, <clears throat> sorry, that hand-eye coordination and the finger grip strength, right? So again, my mace is, I'm strengthening their fingers, I'm strengthening their grip, their wrists. Uh, and when I get them flowing and the mace is spinning all around, they're gonna be coordinated after doing that for a, a while, right? Coordination, right. Is, in my opinion, coordination is a muscle and you can work it, you can build it, you can strengthen it. So that's what these ladies are doing with their flows. Then when we look at the spike, it's that slam forward motion. That's just a pull, right? A barbarian pull if we break it down to its uh, yang base or that 10 and 2, that 360 if we want to get more yin with it, right? Right. So it's very, very, like applies a ton. Um, if we, yeah, any sport, like historically the mace was first repurposed as a training tool by Hindu warriors uh, to become better Hindu wrestlers. Uh, I right. can't remember the proper name for the, the style of wrestling that they did, but the mace was the perfect tool because you're controlling this weird movement, this weird leverage, this weird weight, and you're working your grip, you're working your shoulders, you're working your throws. And it's, it's a huge tool. And historically, you can even pick out people who have been in combat sports who've done mace training and they've been incredibly successful. Uh, like, have you, do you know anything about the Great Gamma? Have you peeked into that? I yet? actually have watched, I think I watched like a mini documentary on YouTube and I thought it was like amazing. So cool. So for those out there that don't know, the Great Gamma was, um, I, I want to say Indian wrestler, but he was in the Indian area, like the subcontinent there. 
anyways, he was an undefeated wrestler. Uh, and I'm talking like what's now referred to as shoot wrestling, not like the WWE style, but we'll get to that in a second. Uh, more like the traditional style of wrestling. And he was undefeated. He could throw any man. He went to England at one point and uh, challenged all their champions and none of their champions would fight him. So he started like offering them huge money if they could even throw him and no one could throw him and he'd throw people around the ring. He was unreal. He even got... Uh, he wrestled in front of sheiks and shahs and kings and queens, and he was unreal. And mm-hmm. his big thing was the gata, so the, the traditional wooden mace with the, uh, the big block on the end. And the, if you look him up, one of the first things that it says is the great gamma, uh, undefeated wrestler known for his excessive use of the gata. There you go. So he was unreal. Like if you find photos of him, the most common photo of him is shirtless, big old mace on his shoulder, standing on, uh, I want to say a lion. Like, uh, yeah, yeah. Belt. Like, it's just phenomenal. Uh, and, he, like, he was so known for swinging the mace and for honing his strength in that way that I can't remember what prince it was, but some English prince actually gave him a solid silver mace as a, a gift. So, so known for it. Um, if we want to go down the sports entertainment style of wrestling um one there's <clears throat> sorry one there's um the iron sheik so the iron sheik back in the 70s when he was um in the nwa would swing persian meals uh so kind of a cross between the club and the the mace just to kind of dummy it down uh, he would swing them in the ring before matches and he would challenge people that if anyone could swing his meals more than him, he would give them a thousand dollars or something like that. <laughs> so it has that too. And then we look at um, uh, Carl Gotch. So who's, he's arguably one of the greatest wrestlers of all time. He's a German guy who wrestled in Japan and in Japan was known as the God of professional wrestling. Uh, and he, uh, there's a whole bunch of moves named after him now, like the German suplex, one of the most common names or one of the most common moves in professional wrestling was named that because he pioneered it and he was from Germany. Uh, he was an unreal mace swinger. He swung meals and such too, but he was very into the mace. Uh, there's Jake Shannon. I want to say his last name is, he goes by anomalous on Instagram. He was one of Carl's students back in like the late nineties, early two thousand. So that dude's been swinging a mace in America. Like he's an American. He's been swinging a mace for close to 20 years now. And it just, it shows like yeah. people who need to work and live and be active in just different planes with different styles of strength. The mace is a perfect crossover tool. It's yeah, it's great. Yeah, no. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, so in, in essence, in conclusion, it's great for sports. It's great for wrestling. I mean, it's, it's great for just an everyday athlete, so an everyday person, too. Totally. Yeah, pretty totally. much if you have a pulse, you should be swimming a mace. <laughs> there you go. There you go. I love that. Uh, so, okay, so for complete beginners, uh, you know, or someone getting uh, into the mace, what are some tips, some tricks, some – your message on that like what can they do what do they start off with so one get a mace uh (laughs) yeah pretty basic first step tons of different places you can go out there like i mentioned earlier we have a gatsu up here is generally our best option uh for canadians in the states you guys have a crazy amount of options um amazon is a big option no matter where you are in the world if you're can't really shell out the bucks for it. The first thing I did when I got home from LA was I went and got the biggest sledgehammer I could find. Mm-hmm, right. So that's not to do anything where there's weight on the one end and not on the other, right? You get that leverage. Um, there's different ways to make your own mace. I won't really get into that as I don't know. Uh, I'm not very well versed in that, but again, Instagram's a great tool for that. Yeah. Uh, if you know a welder, they can custom make you maces, which is awesome. Like my custom fillable, and I have a, a 30 kilo mace, a 66 pound mace uh, that's getting made up for me next week. So step one, get a mace. There you go. Step two, find some sort of resource on how to use it. Your best resource is going to be a coach that knows what they're doing. So in the States, again, there's tons of coaches out there. Matt, Leo, Gypsy, um, Rick awesome right uh jake there's 
people all over. Just Google it uh, and be on Google it, Instagram it. Search on right. Instagram. And real Maybe quick, if, if I want you to do it too, but I mean, there's a, on my website, there's an actual find a coach section. I want to try to get all the coaches together because I want people to just have this one place where they can go and find a coach locally. So Perfect. go check that out on the website so that we can find coaches for you. Yes. Thank you for doing that. Someone needs to do that. I'm, I'm happy you're doing that. That's awesome. So yeah, if you can find a coach, use them. Coaches all around, both Canada, the US, all over Europe, all over, everywhere. Like there's coaches everywhere that are willing to show. And the, the nice thing with the Maze community is we are very accessible because we're, the majority of us are obsessed with Instagram. So even if you're, you can't get a hold of a local coach for one reason or another, shoot someone a message. Um, it's one thing to see someone moving and to try and mimic that movement. That's a great thing to do, but if you can then talk to them and get the tips and tricks on the little kind of uh, minute details of that movement, it's going to be way handier. Um, I'm very open on my Instagram. Ask me any question. I'll do my best to answer as quickly as possible. And the majority of the Mace people out there are like that as well. Uh, workshops are held all over as well by different people. Rick travels all the time. Leo travels all the time. Uh, that's what I eventually want to be doing is traveling and hosting workshops. Uh, Rich Thurman as well. He, he travels around yes. all, all over the place and does workshops get into a workshop, whatever. Beyond that, there are instructional videos, YouTube. Um, Leo has that whole video series out now as well. Right. His course is out now, guys, yeah. go check it out. And it's awesome. I, I picked it up too. Like it's, it's phenomenal. Um, if you can't really learn from watching videos, if you can get access to a coach, uh, there are different coaches as well that offer, offer online training. You can get that set up. The big thing is with anything, if you want to learn something, you find someone who excels at that and you learn from them right. in whatever way, shape or form. And then I guess step three would be define your practice, get creative with it. So there's a million different ways to move with the maze, right? Even just beyond flow and competition style or traditional style. Create your own, do what you do. When I teach classes, we do three classes a week. One is purely competition style. So we just do swings, 10 and twos, 360s, that kind of stuff at varying times. We do a flow class, and then we do what I call work, just pure work. Leverage lifts, squats, lunges, just broken down, grinded out more of your traditional kind of fitness style class. And we, we try and play with it all. And that has come from just playing. That's right. a big thing. If you're not having fun, don't do it. Like play, have fun, figure out different ways to move with the maze. The beautiful thing about it is in the West here, it's so new. There's no wrong way to do it. There yeah. are ways that might be a little bit better to move with it in the sense that, you know, better form, better technique. This is a more efficient way of movement, but no movement style is wrong. Like that's, that's something that's really ingrained in the Western world, especially Western athletes is there's this way to do it. Right. Right. If you're going to run this play in football, you run it this way. If you're going to throw a baseball, you're going to throw it this way. Right. There's, there's a lot of this is how it's done. And then the people who do it a little bit differently are like, and are successful are anomalies in the mace world in the martial arts world. It's completely the opposite. Like figure out your own style of movement and own it. Right. Own it. Right. And, and it's funny that you mentioned that because uh, I'm certified with Kips and New Breed Mace Bell. New Breed Mace Bell is actually, and even Kips with Genesis Flow, they have this, like Genesis Flow, first of all, has this like their own flowing style and I love it. It's different. It looks so different than what Leo has or you have, or it's, it's, it's interesting to see the different uh, styles. And then you have New Breed, which is a little more like it's almost like a hit class, like metabolically conditioning stuff. So it's like, it's so cool to see everyone like pick up the mace and do their own thing. Totally. The new breed uh, crew, love them. They terrify me. <laughs> they terrify me. Just the style that they work in. Like, I love it. Like, it's so visually appealing. It's obviously effective as all hell, but it terrifies me. Yeah, it's because so from what I know, they have a CrossFit background. So I oh. think that kind of like helped kind of like morph this like really cool. And I have a CrossFit background, so I absolutely love it. I'm not terrified. I just love those movements. 
yeah, their their style, it's it's so cool, but I uh, it just it freaks me out. But it's obviously so effective. It's not <laughs> it's not something I would probably like. I I shouldn't say that. Like I want to try every style mace at some point. Like I, I will eventually get down to I want to say they're in Jersey and uh, and learn from yeah. them a little bit too. But oh yeah, they're they're something else, and I love it. And that's the thing. Like there's so many different styles out there. If you are ever gonna pick up a mace, don't define yourself. Be be formless again. Back to Bruce Lee. Be formless. Be um, be shapeless. Be water. Right? Yeah. So that's and we see it in everything, right? In so rugby, for example, there's sevens and there's fifteens, and there are guys that they just play sevens, and there are guys that they just play fifteens. The best athletes play both. Um, kettlebell. There's your hard style, and then there's your GX, mm-hmm. your sport, right? And then there's like American and Russian styles. There's tons of different styles. Again, the best athletes are one that plays around a little bit with all of them, as opposed to just really defining themselves. The mace, huge. It's so new. People are coming up with new styles every day. But again, don't just, don't be one style. Don't be someone who just competes. Because if you just compete, you're just working that one system, right? You're just working that one style and you're, you're losing so much from what the maze can do. Don't just flow. Because if you don't get that solid base of the traditional movement, you're, again, you're losing out on so much the tool has to offer. So be as open as possible to different styles, different systems, and just different techniques. Like taking as much information as you can, create your own style, create your own system, do what you can, do what you want, enjoy the maze, however it is, right? Yeah. Own it. Yeah. Right on. All right. So where can people find you online? Um, if they want to, do you do online training? Uh, where can they find you physically? Go for it. Okay. So find me physically. I am in Regina, Saskatchewan, Canada. So middle of the prairies. I am willing to travel pretty much anywhere in Saskatchewan, but due to those huge landmass that is Canada, I can't really go further than that. But hit me up and I know trainers all over the country. I can help you with that if you're somewhere else. Um, finding me online, I have a website, warriorflowfitness.com. So warriorflowfitness.com. I love the warrior. Sorry? I love the warrior in there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Again, it's back to that genetic memory. Somewhere in your ancestry, in everyone's ancestry, there was a warrior. And our insides, our hearts know that. Right on. Uh, so you got to embrace it. Um, also, yeah, so warriorflowfitness.com. Uh, Warrior Flow on Facebook. Uh, but the biggest thing is Instagram. I have two pages. There's Warrior Full Fitness, and there is Franken Legs. So, right. like Frankenstein, but legs instead of Stein. I was going to ask you about that. I totally forgot. So now you know, people. The, the, the Franken Legs thing, uh, it started with the knee thing that I mentioned earlier when I tore my ACL. So, I was given three options. Uh, they could give me, they could remove. Uh, a piece of my hamstring to replace my ACL with that. Yeah. They could remove a smaller tendon in my knee. I want to say the LCL and replace it for PCL, uh, one of the two, and replace my ACL with that. Or they could give me a cadaver ACL. So the first option, the hamstring would have made me lose strength and speed. The ligament replacement would have made me lose lateral movement. At the time, I was playing semi pro rugby and I had had a call from Canada. So that was still the goal at that point was to try and make a professional side or uh, more, even more so the Canadian national side. Uh, so I didn't want to lose either option. So then it came down to the cadaver. So I have a dead guy's ACL now. Uh, so that's wow. where that started. I, I got to, my rugby friends started calling me Frank and me. It was Frank and me first. But then my very next full season back, I shattered my fibula, like I mentioned. And so now I have a nine inch plate with eight screws in there. Wow. So Frank and knee got morphed into Frank and legs. And I actually, I have a big old portrait of uh, Boris Karloff's Frankenstein tattooed on that leg now because of that. And I have a bride of Frankenstein on the other side and just kind That's of. That's so cool. I've taken it and ran with it. Right on. All right. So now, now listeners know. Now they know where to find you and they have the story. That's awesome. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for being on this podcast. I appreciate hey, it. I appreciate you. Um, listeners, um, 
remember where to find him. I'll make sure to put it in the blog post so you'll have all the links down there. And uh, Zach, if you have any resources that you can send me over email, I'll go ahead and post those in the blog too. And uh, guys, just don't forget, you guys can support this podcast by purchasing a t-shirt on the stillmazewarrior.com website or by visiting the Patreon page at patreon.com slash stillmazewarrior. All right. Thank you so much, Zach. And may the universe always flow with you. Thank you so much as well for listening to my ramblings. I talk a lot when I get onto something I'm passionate about and I love the maze. So thank you. Thanks everyone for listening. You rock. See you next week. Peace out.